this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we do receive it. Written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on God's spiritual work in your life, and we're talking about the spiritual knowledge of God. We saw the importance of getting precise, accurate, spiritual knowledge. It is essential. So therefore, if we have to get the knowledge of God, we need to know what all God wants us to know. And we're going through in depth through the New Testament, looking at the things that are brought up that are important for you to know and put in operation in your life. We see in 1 John 2.20 that you have an unction, this means an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. We can know all things by the Holy Spirit who will bring revelation of the truth to us. We have to study the Word. We have to be ready to listen to and receive the revelation that He brings. Every scripture is true. He will open your eyes to the truth of what the scriptures mean. We're going to continue on in the book of Colossians tonight. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, Timotheus, our, bo our brother. And who did he write to? Did he just write to anybody who is at Colossae? No. To the saints. This means the holy ones. This is an adjective. This is the word. It is an adjective. That, the way you would translate an adjective is holy ones in the Greek. And to the faithful brethren, that of course also is an adjective. This is the word for faithful, an adjective. So who's he writing to? The holy ones and the faithful brethren in Christ. Those are the ones who are going to see the promises of God and see God bring forth what he purposes in their life. That are at Colossae. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That means grace and peace is to the saints the holy ones and the faithful brethren, not just to anybody, because there are conditions to be met to see God's grace and peace, His promises come to pass. He says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He wants you to know that He wants you to be always praying, not just praying for your needs in your own life, but praying for others. These guys were praying for others. You need to be a servant of the Lord and praying for others. Have you been praying for others? This week, you need to be praying for others. Don't just be thinking about yourself. They were always praying for them. They were servants of the Lord. Verse 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints, their faith was well known. Your faith should be known. It should be seen. It should be shown forth by your actions, by your words, by your, the way you're possessing promises, the things that are occurring in your life. And also the love that you have to all the saints, all the holy ones. You should be showing forth love, seeing everybody as valuable and precious and ministering love to people. You operate in faith, you operate in love, as well as hope, those three, the, th the three things that abide. Verse 5, for the hope, that's the confident expectancy that's laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? What's laid up for us in heaven? We saw it was the covenant and the inheritance that's laid up for us, reserved for us in heaven in the covenant that we have. And that's the confident expectancy that's laid up for us is all these promises that have been given to us and they're all declared in the covenant. And how did we find out about it? We heard about it in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as the word came unto them, as it is in all the world, and brings forth fruit. God's word brings forth fruit and those that take hold of it and do it. He wants you to know, as God's word's coming forth to you, it will produce fruit in your life if you do what it says. It won't automatically do it. You must act upon it and be a doer of the word to see the fruit come forth in your life. He says it doth also in you since the day you heard of it. That's a good testimony. They heard it. The day they heard it, they put it in operation. That's the way you ought to be. You hear God's word, you put it in operation right away. You don't just let it slip or let it slide or forget about it. You know, you're, a, you're ready to be a doer of what you hear. And knew the grace of God in truth. How did they know the grace of God in truth? Because they saw the fruit of the Word of God. Because what is God's grace? His favor toward us. And when does His grace come to us? 
when we meet the conditions of the Word of God. The grace of God will come in truth, and that truth manifests, remember, because we've continued in the Word. John 8, 31, 32, we looked at, if you continue in the Word, then are you my disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So they knew, and when it says knew here, they became thoroughly acquainted with it. They knew it accurately because they saw the Word working. It's the Word of His grace. Remember, it'll build you up and give you your inheritance, Acts 20, verse 32. It'll bring these things to pass. These guys saw the Word working in their life. So, God wants, to know the, wants us to know the Word. And he comes down to verse 9 and He says this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and the desire, this is the word iteo, meaning make a demand of what's due you, that you might be filled with the precise, correct knowledge, accurate, precise, correct knowledge of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Actually, the word spiritual is an adjective, and it really is describing both. It really refers to in the Greek, in all spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's describing both. Showing the fact that God wants us to get the spiritual knowledge of God, be filled with it accurately, precisely, correctly. And He wants us to get spiritual understanding and spiritual wisdom as we get knowledge and understanding and wisdom. What is that going to do for us? That we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You're going to show forth God to God that you really are walking worthy before Him by you doing the Word. Being unto all pleasing, this word pleasing means the desire to please. You walk worthy of the Lord, you show a desire to please because you're a doer of the word that you hear. You're carrying it out. And evidence of that, of course, not only the walk, but what happens when you walk in line with the word and do the word? You will be fruitful. Being fruitful in every good work. God wants you to know that knowledge, understanding, and wisdom enables you to walk worthy of the Lord showing forth your desire to please Him, and the result will be you will be fruitful in every good work. God wants you fruitful in everything you do, every good work. God's Word will always produce fruit. And increasing in the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of God as you continue to seek and gain more knowledge. Strengthen with all power, dunamis. The power of God resident in you produces spiritual strength because of power resident in you because you put on the whole armor of God as we talked about. According to the power of His glory, more literally, the word power is kratos, meaning a manifested power of His glory. When God's power goes into manifestation, the glory of God, the presence of God, shows up. And that's what He will bring forth. He wants you to get empowered within and releasing out the power of God to see the manifest presence of God come forth. Also, what else is the Word going to produce in you? It's going to bring you to the place of being steadfast. Patience is the word steadfast. Where do we need to be steadfast in? In the soulish realm. Steadfast so we don't waver, so we don't draw back, so we don't get deceived, so we don't let our emotions get a hold of us, so we make the right choices, we think according to the Word of God. And long-suffering. Long-suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet, as you are conquering enemies and taking hold of promises with joyfulness. Joyfulness is so important because it protects your faith. It is, causes you to have spiritual strength, a place of protection. You need the joy of the Lord. Without the joy of the Lord, the enemy will be able to stop your faith from working. You need to have that rejoicing continually in the Lord, not, not being moved by the circumstances that you're dealing with. And then the thing he wants us to know, you're to give thanks unto the Father who has made you meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God wants you continually giving thanks unto him. He wants you to partake of the inheritance, all the inherited promises. They're given to you. All the promises of God are yea and in him, amen. And we have this inheritance reserved for us in heaven. He wants you to be a partaker of the inheritance. So you're going to give thanks to the Father. That's all talking about New Testament prayer. Giving thanks to the Father in the name of Jesus as you bring, take hold of the promises of God to see them come to pass in your life. 
Verse 13, another thing he wants you to know. He wants you to know that he has delivered you from the authority, exousia, of darkness. And he has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. You have been delivered from the authority of the devil. That means he has no authority over you. You have authority over him. You've been brought into the kingdom. That's the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the King of kings, Lord of lords. He will rule over all of your enemies when you put him in operation, putting the authority that he's delegated you in operation. Another thing he wants you to know, because of the redemption of what it means here, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the payment of the price, what's that produced? The forgiveness of sins. But what does forgiveness mean? It's the word aphesis, which means the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins. You are not under the bondage of sin any longer. You are to be released from the bondage or the imprisonment of sin, and you are to walk in victory. Sin has no dominion over us. We can conquer every sin, because sin gives place to the devil. The wages of sin is death. Sin will bring destruction. Now we can walk free from it. And as you're seeing all these things, you're getting the knowledge of God, you're getting the understanding, you're getting the wisdom, you're walking worthy before Him, you're getting full, full of the power of God, you're, you're being steadfast and long-suffering and joyfulness, and, and you're seeing the power of God and the glory of God manifest in your life. And you're giving thanks, taking hold of promises, and you know you're out from under the authority and you're released from bondage and imprisonment, you can conquer all areas of sin. Where is He taking you to? Well, this is where He wants to bring you to. Colossians 1.21, You that were sometime alienated in enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He's brought us back into relationship with him when we've been born again. But what else? He goes on and says, In the body of his flesh through death to present you. See, all these things are for what he wants to accomplish, to present you holy and unblameable. This means without blemish. And unreprovable, meaning you can't be called into account because you're walking in the ways of the Lord in His sight. Otherwise, God wants to bring you to the place, and He will, to bring you to the place of being holy, without blemish, and unreprovable, that you are blameless and cannot be called into account on anything because you are, you've gone into perfection. You're walking in the way of the Lord in righteousness and holiness in His sight. And then He says how this is going to happen. If, well, that's the condition, if you continue in the faith, which is, of course, walking in the way of the Spirit, according to the Word of God, grounded, this means the foundation laid. God wants you to know that this will happen for you in your life if you continue in the faith and you have laid the foundation. How do you get the foundation laid? Hearing and doing the Word lays the foundation in your life. If you don't hear it, you haven't laid the foundation, the attacks of the enemy will knock you down. They'll be, they'll, you'll be, remember the house that could stand when the foundation was laid because they're hearers and doers and the other one wasn't. He got blown away. He had a great fall. So you've got to have the foundation laid. And also he says settled. Settled means you are firm, you are immovable, you are steadfast, nothing can move you. That's where God wants to bring you to. You're not going to be wavering. You're not going to be wa drawing back. You're not going to be doubting. You're not going to be on one minute and off the next, turning to the right or left. No, you're going to be set, firm, immovable, steadfast. Notice, this is all conditions for him to be able to present you holy and without blemish and unrebukable. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel also means we never move away from the hope. What is the hope? The confident expectancy of the, of the good news. The confident expectancy of the good news is all these promises that have been given to us, the hope that's laid up for us in heaven, and we are never to be moved away from having our focus on the promises that belong to us. We are to possess those promises. All the promises of God are yea, and in Him, amen. Therefore, he wants you to know that his purpose is to bring you to the place of presenting you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. And who's that? When? That's going to be presented to Jesus when he comes back. And this will happen if you meet the conditions. 
of continuing in the faith, foundation laid, you're settled, firm, immovable, steadfast, nothing can shake you whatsoever. We come down to verse 26. He also wants you to understand this great mystery that was hid from all the, all the enemies, all the evil spirits. Satan did not know it. The people of the world did not know it. Only those who receive it by revelation who come into relationship. The mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations now is made manifest to his saints, the holy ones. The ones that are holy walking before him, God will give you revelation of the mysteries of God, give you revelation of all the things that he has for you. And he goes on in verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the confident expectancy of glory. When God has come to dwell in you, which he has, he wants to manifest himself with the glory of God in your life. Remember, we are to be obtaining not only the kingdom, but also the glory, the manifest presence of God. He wants to bring you to the place where the presence of God is going to be manifest because he comes to make you his habitation. He comes to abide in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Not only is it teaching, but it's also warning, warning and admonishing people. You've got to walk in this ways or you're not going to see God's work done. If you don't walk in the ways of the Lord, you're going to give place to the devil and you're going to see destructive things come in your life. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We've seen this so many times in the other books and we see it again here. God is going to bring you and I to the place of perfection. We are going on into perfection. All the people that say that we're always going to sin and we'll never be able to go to perfection are telling you false teaching. The Bible says, once the foundation is laid, you are to go on into perfection. He present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That is what we're to come to. And then he wants you to know something else about how is this going to happen? Because you're going to be in a warfare. Wherefore, I also labor, striving. This is the word agonizomai, which means to contend with adversaries. It also means the same as fight, for fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy 6.12. So, he says you're going to be contending with the adversary and fighting according to his working. Meaning, you've got to do things God's way, according to the word. You can't do it your way. I've had people say, well, I, this is my way of doing things. I say, well, that's contrary to the word. That's not his working. That's your working. It's not going to go anywhere whatsoever. No. We've got to do it according to his working, which worketh in me or is operative in me mightily. This means in power, dunamis. It's operating in power. Otherwise, when you put his working in operation, it'll be working in you in power. But that's why we got to do things according to the word. We can't do things our way. We can't do things because well, I heard some, got this you know, revelation of something. If it's not in line with the word, there's a problem. We always do things according to his working. Also, we see in Colossians 2, verse 2, he wants you to know, as he spoke to them about their hearts being comforted, being knit together in love and to all the riches of the full assurance. The full assurance is a word which means most certain confidence. Most certain confidence. The riches of the most certain confidence of understanding. When you have spiritual understanding, you should have a most certain confidence that God will bring things to pass. No question about it. Understanding comes, it's imparted by the Lord when you have been doing the knowledge of God and he imparts the spiritual understanding unto you. So the riches of the most certain confidence of understanding to or unto the precise correct knowledge is what this means of the mystery of God. It's revealed to us through the word of God. We get the precise correct knowledge of the mystery 
That's what he, revelation, knowledge brings us. And we come to the place of absolute certain confidence of the understanding that we're going to enter in and we're going to possess everything that God has for us. He brings us to the next verse. You need to know that in whom, talking about in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, they're all in, in him. So why do people look to extra biblical books? <laughs> there are people that look to books that are not a part of the canon of scripture. Ones that are even lies, that are not even true. It's amazing how people do this. They're totally deceived. They're totally have denied what this verse is all about. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and that's going to be in line with the Word of God. It's not going to be from things that are extra biblical books or looking to anything outside of the Word of God. That's why the Word is what you need to study. You've got to know. Put the Word first place and stay away from any of these ones that try to tell you to go look at some other books for truth. And that's, that's how cults have gotten formed. And we got them inside the body of Christ, bringing all these ungodly, false works and the, looking to them as though they are truth. It's a lie. Verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you. What's going to happen if you don't look to the right things, which is the Word of God? You look to these other things. You're going to get deceived. Lest any man should beguile you, deceive you by false reasoning, with enticing words to deceive you, to persuade you in some other direction. It's amazing how people have done this in the body of Christ. We don't want to be led with enticing words, often error, deceived by false reasoning, especially from people that have brought things that are not in line with the Word of God. He wants you to know, you got to make sure, check everything out and find out if it's in line with the Word of God exactly. If not, get rid of it. Don't, don't receive it. Don't have anything to do with it because you don't want to be deceived by anybody. Verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, join in beholding your order. God wants you to know you're to be in order. There is a spiritual order that is to be established in your life in line with the Word of God. We need to come in line with His order. It means we just don't do things our way. We do things His way. Beholding your order, the fact that they were, had a fixed order, orderly condition, arrangement, essentially, right order, all refers to this, all the things that God wants in your life. He wants us to come in line. Your life should be ordered after the Word of God and everything that you do. Not only that, but also the steadfastness of your faith. And this is not the word that we normally see hupomone for steadfastness. This is a different word. This is a word which again refers to that which is brought a foundation, uh, a fortified place, which is causes it to be firm, a firmness. Um, in, and also they even say here, um, the metaphor in a military sense, a solid front. Otherwise, you're strong, you're solid. You are so strong and solid and firm and it's like a fortified place, nothing's going to break through. That's what he's talking about of your faith. Your faith is to come like that. He wants your faith to be so solid and strong, nothing can knock it down. It's because it's grown. It's to grow exceedingly. You're to have your faith in operation. Your faith becomes so strong, you can move any mountain. You can resist any attack that comes against you. You can hold up that shield of faith and quench any fiery dart of the wicked one. But your faith, you can move any mountain. You can cast out any devil because you have your faith to the place where it is firm, it is steadfast, it is solid. Nothing can move it. He wants you to know that that's where he's bringing you to. Order spiritually and solid strong, nothing can move it, faith. And then he comes to verse 6. He wants you also to know, as you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You just don't receive him and then just go whatever way you want. No. Now you are to be walking in him, which means you're going to be walking in line with the word of God. This is a command. This is not a suggestion, imperative mood. And it's a present tense verb, meaning that you are to be walking continuously in Him. 
Otherwise, this is your lifestyle. This is your track in a record that's shown for it. You have a walk consistently. God looks back and sees what you've done the last day or week or month or six months or a year. What does he see? Has he seen you've been walking consistently? That's what he wants to see for you in your life. Root and how are you going to be able to do it? Well, you're going to do it because you're going to get rooted, the root system established, and built up. Build up in him. Remember, we're like building a spiritual house as we hear and we do the word of God. He wants you to get rooted. And when it's interesting, this word rooted, remember the root system comes from hearing and doing the word as well. This is talking about something that gets accomplished and in the past and is established in you on an ongoing basis. The reason I say that is because the word rooted happens to be a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek refers to action completed in the past with present effects and results at the time of speaking. In other words, you have been rooted in the past because the work's been done and it's continued on and that's the way it is right now at the time of speaking. That means, you, that again, that shows the fact that you have got the work accomplished and it's continuing in your life. And then it says build up. The building up part is a present tense. That means an ongoing action. So the rooting is what's been done in the past. The building up is what's continuing on in the present through hearing and doing the word, ongoing action. See, we're never going to be stagnant or just sitting still. We're always going to be increasing, building and growing and developing. But we got to get this established in us, the root system established that stays there just like the tree. The root system is established and then the tree keeps on growing, doesn't it? And it keeps on producing fruit and, and, and expanding. That's exactly, essentially, what it's saying here for you and I spiritually. And no, not only that, but established in the faith. And this word means to be firm, to be sure, to be uh, uh, sta stabilized, essentially. He wants you to be firm. He wants you to be sure. He wants you to come to the place of being stable in all that you do. When you do that, he goes on and says, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding with thanksgiving. That means you're thanking him all the time. What am I thanking him for? The promises as you take hold of them. Also, all the things that he has done in your life. You thank him for what he's done. You thank him for what he is doing as you're taking hold of the promises. So you're going to be thanking him as you're putting your faith in operation, as well as for all the great things that you see him happen. You see God working and moving in your life. Thank him for answering this prayer. Thank him for providing this situation. Thank him for delivering you from this. Thank him for restoring you, you know, whatever it might be. He wants you abounding with thanksgiving. So these are things that he wants you to know. He wants you to get this root system established and be continually building in your life. And he wants you to be continually established in the faith, abounding with thanksgiving. Another thing he wants you to know, he wants you to know you got to beware because the devil will try to get to you. Beware, lest any man spoil you and try to spoil you in some way to get you off track. When he talks about spoiling here, this is the word, which means essentially to carry one off as a captive and a slave and to lead him away from truth and subject to one sway, regardless of what it is. Anytime you get off the word, whether you realize it, you've been carried away captive. You've been led away from the truth. You've come, become subject to something else. We can't allow that to happen in our life. The devil will try to work. Let no man or no one spoil you or take you captive. And how could he do that? Through philosophy. That's the philosophy of the world. No, we're not going to follow worldly philosophies. We're going to follow the word of God. Oh, the world says this is what you should do. What is that in line with the word? Forget it. You're not going to follow that way. And vain, which means devoid of truth, deceit. Something that is void of truth will, of course, be false and it will deceive you. You'll get spoiled if you get deceived. 
by anything contrary to the word. That's why, how can you protect yourself from that? Check out the word on everything. Search the scriptures to see if something's so. If it's not so, forget it. I don't care who says it or what kind of supposed uh, revelation they think they got. It's not in lot right. And then he goes on, you know, after he says, through the philosophy of the vain to see, after the tradition of men. Do we follow traditions of men? No. Commandments of men? No. Anything that's of men? No. We're following the ways of heaven above. We're following the ways of the word of God. And these traditions of men are after the principles. This means the, the rudiments are the, the principles, the, the first principles of the world and not after Christ. Again, anything that's contrary to the word will spoil you, cause you to be captive because you've given place to it through philosophy or you've been deceived some way. You follow after the traditions of men or after something to do with the world and not after Christ and it will take you down a path of destruction. Another thing he wants you to know, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat, that'd be what you eat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath. Days is actually italicized, it's not there, of the Sabbath. Sabbath is actually what's plural in the Greek, as Young brings out. So, what is this talking about? This is talking about, don't let anybody judge you wrongly about these things. Do we keep the Old Testament, holy days, new moon, Sabbath? No. Why? Because the Old Testament is over. They were all types and shadows pointing towards what Jesus would accomplish. It even says, which are a shadow of things to come. They're types of things to come, of the coming things, as Young, Young's brings out. Shadow the coming things. And the body of the Christ. Is is not there in the translation. They're all pointing towards the things that Jesus was going to accomplish and he fulfilled them. Would we keep the, let's say like the Passover, you know, for some people that, what they keep, in the, what was the Passover meal? It was the Seder. Do we keep a Seder today? No way. That's essentially a denial that Jesus went to the cross and was the Passover lamb. You do that, that's an abomination. You're in trouble if you would do such a thing. Yet people observe those things amazingly. That's a denial of Jesus. He fulfilled the first four feasts on the exact day and he's going to fulfill the last three in the second coming, although in one aspect he already has fulfilled tabernacles and the fact that he was born, that was the beginning fulfillment of it. And he's going to be fulfilling all those in the second coming, and they all point towards that work. So are we going to keep these in an Old Testament sense? Absolutely not. We're not going to keep them in a physical sense. So anybody that tries to tell you to do this, including the Sabbath, the Sabbath means rest, and who is our rest? Jesus. What, was the, what, what, what does that mean? Jesus is the fulfillment of it because now he is our rest and what do we now have? There is a rest that remains of the people of God which is a sabbatismos rest which is entering into the spiritual rest by possessing the promises of God. Not some keeping a day. Does that make you holy? Does that make you enter into the spiritual rest? No. It was all type pointing towards what Jesus Christ would accomplish. But we got all these Christians out here that are doing all these things in error. Do we keep these? No, we do not keep these. He doesn't want to, don't let anybody judge you in any of these things. In fact, really, in, in reality, if we keep a physical day in the New Testament age after Jesus fulfilled that day, it's a denial that he even fulfilled it, which means that person's in trouble. That's sin. We go on to cha Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3 is another thing he wants us to know. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Are we, have we been risen with Christ? What's that referring to? He was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. Have you and I had the same thing? Yes, when we got born again. We were born from being spiritually dead unto spiritual life, the same thing. We have been risen from spiritual death with Jesus Christ. 
What are we to do now? We're to seek the things above, because that's where we were born from, from above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You're to seek heaven's ways and learn the word of God. Set your affection. This means uh, to have understanding in your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Where should your mindset be? Where should you be seeking to get understanding from the Word of God, the revelation of the things above, the ways of heaven that you and I are now to walk in, not the things on the earth? For you are dead. Remember, you're dead. The old you is dead and gone. You have a brand new on the inside of you, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we're now we are to seek the things above, not the things on the earth. Another thing he wants you to know, verse 5, mortify. He wants you to know you are to put to death, therefore, your members that are upon the earth, a fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, this is evil longing for things that are forbidden, covetousness, a greedy desire to have more, which is idolatry. You're to put these things to death. This is all of the flesh. It's not what God wants you to do. For those things, which things wrath, the sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. We're to get rid of all these things. We walked in in the past and lived in them, but we're not to have many more. So what are we supposed to do? God wants you to know you're to put off all these things. Verse 8. Now, you also put off, put aside, put away all these. And these are more works of the flesh in addition to what was just mentioned. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication coming out of your mouth. We should not let any kind of filthy communication, foul, obscene speech, or any kind of thing that's evil coming out of our mouth whatsoever. Lie not one to another. We shouldn't be lying. Liars end up in the lake of fire. Seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. But then also, he wants us also to know, not only do you put off the old ways that we lived in from the human nature, but we're going to put on something now as we're brand new on the inside and in spirit. We need to put on something so we walk in heaven's ways as we're seeking the things above. So through the word, we put on the new man. This new man is the word of God coming into us, renewing us, as it says, which is renewed in knowledge, precise, correct knowledge. The more you get your mind renewed in precise, correct knowledge to the Word of God, the more that you will put on, and this actually means to clothe yourself. Clothe oneself. You're, going to, you're actually clothing yourself with the new man by being renewed in precise, correct knowledge. He wants every one of us to get the knowledge of God in us. He goes on in verse 12, and he also tells us what else to put on. Not only do we put on the new man through that, but he tells us to put on a lot of specific things that are replacing the things that we put off. We're putting on, therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, get rid of the pride, kindness instead of being, you know, mean, meekness, a gentleness and mildness instead of being harsh, long-suffering instead of getting frustrated and upset and throwing the towel so easily. All those things are the flesh. You put those away. You put all these, these things on now. These are the things of the Lord. That's what he wants. Forbearing, that means holding up one another. Not being critical, not judging, not trying to put people down or you know, make yourself look better than them. And forgiving one another. You've got to forgive everybody regardless of what they've done. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And then he goes on and says, and above all these things, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. If we're going to go on to perfection, we have to get love established. God wants you to grow up in love. He wants you to increase and abound in love. He wants you to come to the place where you're walking in love in everything you do. Verse 15. Another thing he wants you to know. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Meaning... Rule means to act as an umpire, meaning in your being led in the things that you do, you want to be sure you have peace. God will lead you with peace. And peace will be like an umpire on the inside of you to show you that's the right move. If you don't have peace, you're unsettled about something, then you know oh, there's something wrong there. Peace will be like an umpire ruling in your heart, 
So you'll know the things that God wants you to do. You're to be led by peace. The peace of God will come. Another thing he wants you to know. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. God wants his word richly in you in all wisdom. And notice how it's going to come into you one of the ways. By teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That means as we are praising and worshiping God, there's something else going on. We're not just ministering unto Him. We're also seeing God teach and admonish us with the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The words of the songs are important. They've got to be in line with the Word of God. They are teaching you things. They could be exhorting you things. They could be admonishing you. You better do these things or these things will happen. That's why the words of the songs are important. They've got to be in line with the Word of God and they're either they're going to produce either teaching you something, admonishing you in some way, as well as ministering praise and worship unto God at the same time. This is why we sing the songs we do. We always sing songs that are either exactly scriptural or scriptures linked together. Make sure everything's always in line with the Word of God, never anything that's contrary to the Word, as you're singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. So that's why we aren't ever going to touch. Some people say, well, well, why didn't you sing this popular song? Everybody else sings it out there. I say, well, because it's not in line with the Word. You know, you can't do that. You just, it's, just, it's, it's already it's eliminated. You're not going to do that. The next thing we need to see, God wants you to know that whatsoever, in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything you do, you're going to do it. In, in, in word or deed, you're going to do everything unto the Father in the name of Jesus, thanks to God, Father by Him. You do everything unto the Lord. You're going to carry out all the things that God wants you to do. We also see, as we come down to verse 22, servants, talking about employees, obeying all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. We're to do everything unto God. When you do your work, you do it unto God. You don't, you'll never have any problems because people, if you're doing it unto people, you're going to get upset easily. People will cheat, people will you know, not do things right, people will skirt things, uh, they'll, they'll be mean, they'll they carry on with all kinds of sinful activities and so forth. No, you do it unto the Lord and be the best employee in singleness of heart, fearing God. Whatsoever you do, do it. This doesn't mean heartily, it means out of the soul. Young's corrects this. Out of the soul. This is the word suke below, meaning soul. You do it out of the soul as to the Lord, not unto men. Meaning you do it in your mind, your will, your emotions, everything, your whole being is unto the Lord. Which means you don't let your emotions get involved, you get upset about something, and you got in the flesh. You do your work unto the Lord, you'll stay in the spirit. And you keep a good attitude at all times. That's what he tells you. You're going to do everything you do unto the Lord, not unto men. Knowing, you've got to know this, see, that of the Lord you shall receive the, a reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. In reality, you're serving the Lord by doing things with the right attitude as you're doing your work unto the Lord. You're serving the Lord. You're going to be rewarded for it. But also, verse 25 follows, but he that doeth wrong, if you don't do your work unto the Lord, you do it in the wrong way, you're going to receive for the wrong that you've done. There's no respect to persons. You realize everything you're sowing, you're doing, that's going to, unto God, it's going to come back to you. Whatever you give out, it's going to come back to you. So always do it with the right attitude, and you're going to see God's blessings come back to you. You're going to be rewarded. But if you have that wrong attitude, or you do something that's wrong, then you are going to receive for the wrong that you have done. You're not going to get out of it. No respect of persons. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. If you are an employer, 
Make sure that you give to people what's just and what's equal, what is fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Meaning, if you are not treating your employees fair, you're going to be in trouble. If you are treating one better than another because you like them and you don't really like that other person too much, you're in trouble. You've got to treat everybody just and equal and fair. Employers that don't do that, they are going to have judgments that are going to come upon them because they have a master in heaven. They will not get away with what they're doing. Now, if you see someone doing something unequal, unjust, remember, you're doing it under the Lord. You bind the demons, pray for the person. You know, if you feel comfortable, you go and talk to them about it, good. But at the same time, so they'll possibly come to repentance, but at the same time, do it unto the Lord with a right attitude. Don't let your attitude go south and go negative. Otherwise, it'll start affecting you. Verse 2, another thing he wants us to know. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. God wants you to leave a life of prayer. Pray. Have you been praying today? Did you think to pray? Are you watching spiritually with thanksgiving for others or for whatever situations you might be dealing with? Or to watch and pray? You know, that's important not only to minister for others and be a vessel, but also so you don't enter into temptation yourself. You'll be, if you continue to be spiritually attuned and you're praying, you'll be built up and you won't fall into temptations that will come against you. We come down to verse 5. Another thing he wants us to know. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. In dealing with people without talking about unbelievers, people that aren't born again. You want to make sure you're walking in wisdom toward them. You know, don't expect them to act like believers. They're not going to. You have to understand where they're at. And you need to redeem the time. Don't let them be time wasters. Don't let them rob your time. You want to use your time wisely. Well, sometimes you can even let Christians be doing that. Don't let them take your time either. Be wise with your time so you're getting things accomplished that God wants. Verse 6. Another thing he wants us to know. Let your speech be always with grace. Otherwise, favorable words are coming out of your mouth. It means you don't get in strife, you don't get angry, you don't get upset, you don't give a piece of your mind, you don't, you know, put somebody down, you're not critical, you're not going to be judgmental, you're not going to be, you know, down in the mouth on these things. No. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you must this is the word die, which means necessary is binding, translated must the majority of times. How you must answer every man. Otherwise, the way you speak to people, you're going to be held accountable for. You can't just spew out things you want and not be, think you're not going to be accountable for it. You will be accountable. Make sure your speech is always with Favorable words. Grace would be favorable words. Seasoned with salt. It's going to be a salt like a preservative. It's going to minister good things. That you may know how you must answer every man. That is important. Because you're going to be held accountable, remember. We come down to verse 12. Another thing he wants you to know. See, we're to be servants of the Lord. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, Salute you always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Notice that. He's always, at all times, this is what kind of way he lives. Laboring fervently is one Greek word. It's a word which means to contend with adversaries. Fight. You're going to contend with the adversaries. You're going to fight the good fight of faith. So he's involved in warfare prayers. For you in prayers that you may stand perfect. We're praying for others to come to perfection and complete, filled up in all the will of God. God wants you to learn to pray for others. If you will pray for others, you're giving out, God's going to give back to you. If you're just always embroiled with yourself, that's, you're not giving anything out. God works on giving out, you come back to you. This guy, he was carrying out the ministry of the Lord. He was laboring fervently for all these ones in prayer so they'd be standing perfect and come to the place of being complete and fulfilled in all the will of God. That's what we want for every one of us. Every one of us. 
So you want that for you? Start praying for someone else for that. And guess what? When you give it out, it's coming, and then it's got, God's going to be working to bring that back to you in your life. That's what he wants for all of us. Another thing we see in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Say to Archippus, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Whatever ministry God has given you, he's given us all a general ministry of doing what the word says, he wants you to fulfill it. If he's given you a specific calling, or he has specific gifts or things that he is, or has for you to do, fulfill it. Take heed that you fulfill it. We need to, to carry it out because we're going to give account for everything we do, including carrying out the ministry. We're to be a servant of the Lord and fulfill what he has for us. If you don't know what all the specific things he has, be seeking him as you're walking in line with the word. He'll show you. He'll bring you into the things that he has for you in due season. But take heed to the ministry that you carry it out. Another thing he wants you to know is we go into 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He wants you to know that your faith is a work, your love is a labor, and your hope is a, to be steadfast. He wants these things established in you. Your work of faith, meaning you're going to work your faith. Your faith is not something you just, I just believe. It's not just belief. Belief is what you believe the word, but you work your faith when you apply it, when you speak the word, when you do the word, when you use use your faith and put it in operation. You work it by doing some kind of works of faith. He says he remembers their work of faith. These guys were working their faith. They weren't just sitting around doing nothing. Their faith was their servant. They were working it continually. Are you working your faith every day? Are you putting your faith in operation to work out your own salvation? Are you putting your faith in operation to, to receive promises and pray and take hold of things and do the things God wants? Also, the labor of love. The labor of love, intense labor, where you're working for the Lord, that's giving out to other people. Giving out and ministering to people. It's a labor. It takes some effort on your part to reach out to other people. And he wants that. And also the patience. This means the steadfastness of a confident expectancy in the Lord. He wants you steadfast in your confident expectancy that nothing moves you whatsoever. And then we come to verse 4. Knowing, he wants you to know these things. Knowing, brethren, belo beloved, that you're at your election of God. Now, what is this all about? When he talks about knowing, this is the word that really means to perceive. It happens to be a perfect tense verb, meaning having perceived in the past, to, with present effects now, meaning you know it now, beloved brethren. And the word beloved is also a perfect tense, meaning someone who has, is shown that they have been loving God. It's a verb. It's not a noun or an adjective. Otherwise, someone who's been loving God, brethren who have been loving God, showing that forth in the past, and how do we show we're loving God? Because we keep his commandments. We do the things that he wants. Well, that's how they perceived and knew because they were loving God in the past with effects then as brethren that these guys were chosen of God. They had a track record. They had shown forth their walk. These guys, it was perceived in their life. Because remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. Well, who's the one who's chosen? The one who's responded to the call. This is evidence because they were able to perceive and they saw because they were beloved in the past with the results that these guys were, they were the real deal. They were walking in line with the word. They were carrying things out. God wants you to know. You're going to be chosen because of your track record of following him. That's why every one of us must put the word first place, be a doer of the word, and walk it out. And, of course, how they get to this place. Verse 5, he said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost and much assurance. You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us. Otherwise, the word came. What did they do with it? How did they get to this place of being chosen? 
How did they get to this place of being perceived that these were guys were the real deal and were beloved of the Lord because they were walking in his ways? Because they took hold of the word and they became mametes. Different word for instead of following. Mametes is where we get our word mimic from, meaning they were doing exactly what they saw them do. Saw them do. They were following them. They were mimicking them. They were doing the exact same thing that they did. They just took hold of the things they were taught and they put it all in operation. You became mimickers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost. Pressure came because the devil tries to take the word out, remember? But they were doers of the word in the midst of it. And these guys became mimickers or followers of the Lord. And they got to the place where they were so strong, he says that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. I mean, these guys were hearers and doers. They had such fruit. They were examples to everybody. Everybody could see, hey, these guys are following the Lord. These are walking. God should see that with you. You're an example. Because look at your lifestyle. Look at your walk. Look at what you're doing. See, that's the guy that's going to be chosen. He wants you to have the lifestyle. Be an example to all believers wherever you go. And what else were these guys doing? For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. These guys were going every place, sounding out. That meant they were preaching the gospel. They were sharing the word. They were doing, they were walking in the word. They were showing forth the character and the, the word of God in their life and the character of the Lord Jesus. Every place their faith was being spread abroad. Hey, these guys were not only incorporated in their life as an example, they not only were walking in, in, in the ways of the Lord and, and showing forth that they had the fruit and the beloved of the Lord, but these guys were out there preaching the gospel. They were servants of the Lord. That's why they were chosen. These are the guys that are going to get chosen, as we see. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had into you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And he says, to wait for his son from heaven and when he raised from the dead even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I want to comment on this for a moment because you've got to know what this says. Many people use this verse to say, which delivered us from the wrath to come, meaning we won't be around for the wrath to come because he already delivered us from us, meaning we're going to get out of here before it all happens. Delivered being past tense. Well, if that's true, that would be right. Well, let's put the cursor over the word delivered for a moment. Is that a past tense verb? No, it's present tense. How would you translate this? Who is rescuing us would be a better way, or delivering, but rescue is part of what it means. He is delivering, or he is rescuing us from the wrath. And when it says come, refers to, again, present tense, that is coming. That's why Young's does a good job here who is rescuing us from the anger or the wrath that is coming. Well, that means that we haven't been delivered from it. We're going to be rescued on an ongoing basis from the wrath that is coming, meaning God will deliver us and rescue us and keep us from when, in the midst of when all these things happen. The reason I point this out, though, is so you understand that the teaching that says that this means we're not going to be around here for it is a lie. This is talking about what God will do for us in the midst of the wrath that is coming. He will bring us out of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We pick up over in verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, as you and I are, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. This is another thing God wants you to know. You can't be a man pleaser. You can't be a compromiser in pleasing men. You gotta be a God pleaser. You gotta take a stand. God's trying your heart to find out, are you gonna stand up for him? Are you gonna please God? Or might you back off and please men? We see that happening today. There's whole groups of churches out there that are seeker sensitive man pleasers. We only teach what they'd like to hear. We won't talk about these things because they wouldn't like that. That's a man pleaser. That's a mistake. They're in trouble. Neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. No. 
oh, we need you to, you know, we're going to pass the offering bucket again because we need you to give more, you know. <laughs> I've seen places where they've given two and three offerings, you know. That's crazy. What are they doing? They're covetous. They're trying to get more money and money and money. They got, or they take offerings for about everything you can think of, you know. They got a reason for it all. That's ridiculous. The church is supposed to operate simply off of the tithes and the offerings that the people willingly give, and you receive it in worship unto the Lord, and you don't do anything to try to manipulate the people, take 20 men in offerings or something like this, and try to tell them all the reasons why they should give. That's covetousness. That's ridiculous. It's amazing, these people, they're going to be in big trouble before the Lord when the judgment comes. We aren't going to use any flattering discourse of words. No, we're going to tell it like it is, straightforward. I try to, you know, make it sound good or flatter them or whatever all. No. Or speak things that people would like to hear, you know. We're going to tell them the truth of the Word of God, whether they want to hear it or not, or whether that's pleasing to them or not. Not trying to, you know, defend anybody. We're just going to bring forth the truth, right? That's what we got to do. That's the attitude we must have nor of men sought we glory. What, what you do, can you seek glory of men? No, you gotta seek pleasing God. Neither of you nor yet of others when you might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. We're not gonna seek glory of men whatsoever. No, we wanna glorify God in everything that we do. What else do we do? We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished with her children. How about these pastors that are condemning and tell you, you've got to do this, you better do this or you're in trouble. <laughs> They're out there. It's terrible. I've been to place, place, seen people do that, kind of scold, you know. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you're, they ought to be fired, you know. It's wrong. Gentle. Ministering the truth. You know, we don't hold anything back. But at the same time, we're not going to be harsh and mean and, you know, jump down your throat and things like these kind of things. That's all carnality. It's amazing that these things happen in the body of Christ. They should not be happening at all. So these guys were imparting their own souls, essentially. We're willing to impart unto you, not the gospel of God, but also our own souls. You were dear and just, they were imparting, they were giving out. You know, they weren't holding anything back. And they were working it out in their own life and putting it forth. Giving out the truth of the word of God to them. And notice these guys said, You remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. These guys weren't trying to put, lay, put burdens on the people or whatever. No. They were just going to preach. They labored themselves in their own. They, only, they went out. He was a tent worker and did what he was supposed to do. You know, This is probably places where there wasn't much finances. And so they weren't going to have these guys burden them and so forth. They preached the gospel of God to them. And what else did they do? Your witnesses, God also, how holily, justly, we'd be righteous, unblameably, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. We've got to have the right character. Someone who's, you've got to have the right character in everything you do. You should be showing yourself to be holy. Not holier than thou, but just simply, you're, you're not going to compromise anything of the word. You're going to be just. You're going to do things that are right. You're going to be unblameable. You're going to show forth the character of Jesus Christ in everything that you do. That is what he wants for all of us. They also exhorted, comforted, and charged everyone as a father does his children, ministering to them to encourage them in the things they should do. That's the way you relate to people. That's the way you preach the gospel. That's the way you witness to people. That's why you, where you carry on in relationships with people. If not, there's a problem. But he, God wants us to know these things. And what else does he want us to know? That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. We've been called to the kingdom. That's the rule and the reign of God. And to the glory of God, the presence of God to be manifest in our life. You've got to walk worthy of the Lord, of course. You walk worthy before him, you'll see all these things happen in your life. So he says, for this cause we thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of men, but as, as in truth, the word of God, 
which effectually worketh also in you that believe. When you receive it, if you got to receive it as the word of God, that means this is God speaking to me. Not just the word of men that I'll, th I'll think about it, you know. That's what so-and-so said. Just his attitude. That's why if you're just talking about your own little, your own opinions, or you're giving your own thoughts, or whatever all, or whatever, your little own stories, that's the word of men. No, oh, we want to receive, what were these guys bringing forth? The word of God. And that's what we bring forth, and that's what you need to be receiving. This is the word of God coming to us, that God is speaking to us. He wants us to take hold of it, do it, incorporate it into our life. It's serious business with God. And notice, it effectually worketh in you that believe. I mean, God's word will work if, and put it in operation in you that believe. You're to put it in operation. You're to put this in operation by being a doer of the word. Another thing that we see, you also got to know that the devil can hinder you. you can, don't blame it on God. God's not holding anything back. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Wherefore we have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan can hinder things. Now, do we have authority and dominion? Yes. Of course, there can be, if it's dealing with other people or other situations, that they can be involved and that we don't have authority over people, remember. But the enemy can hinder things from coming to pass. But you can put your faith in operation. If there's anything just directly dealing with you, you can conquer them. This is one of the earlier letters that was written to the church of Thessalonica. Paul grew and got to the place where nobody was forbidding him or hindering him whatsoever. You can come to that place, but you have to know that Satan can hinder you. Not that you submit to that, but that he can be hindering things from coming to pass. So you need to put your authority in operation, start conquering the enemy, start using that authority, binding, loosing, casting out, casting down, take dominion, speak to mountains, and move the enemy's works out of the way. Chapter 3, verse 5, also, what else can the enemy? He talks about, verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Not only will the devil try to hinder you, the devil will tempt you. Remember, he comes for the word's sake, to try to take the word out. You've got to be ready to deal with the temptations. The temptations will come. The devil knows your weak spots. He'll look for opportunities to get you, take you in the wrong direction, try to get you around wrong influences, and if he can, whatever he can do, he'll try to tempt you to get you to draw back from doing the word, and then the labor that you've had in the past will be in vain because the word gets taken out, and there's no more fruit in your life, and you know all this destruction comes. The key is, where's your faith? If your faith is operating in the Lord, you're walking the Lord, you're believing the Word, you're doing the Word, you're putting your faith in operation, then you will conquer the temptations of the enemy. And the labor will be successful that's been sown in you. But if you don't conquer the temptations, then the labor could be in vain. What's the key? He said, I want to know your faith. As you, have you guys operating in faith? Are you using your faith to overcome? Remember, even when the devil attacks, it talks about in 1 Peter 3, 9, or 5, 9, that you resist him steadfast in the faith. You resist the enemy with your faith, and you can conquer and overcome all of his attacks. So that's another important thing. You've got to make sure that your faith is always in operation. Remember, you walk by faith, not by sight. Don't ever let your faith be not an operation. You function in faith in every single thing that you do. Verse 8, another thing you must know. For now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. You're going to see God's life. Jesus comes to bring life, life more abundantly. If, that's the condition, you stand fast in the Lord. This means stand firm, persevere, persist, keep your standing. You don't get moved by anything that comes against you. And you're standing continually, present tense. But this is a conditional statement, remember, not only evidenced by the if, but also by the subjunctive mood. Meaning you are living and you're going to see God's life working in you if you meet the condition of standing fast, firm in the Lord so you can conquer and overcome all the things that come against you. Another thing, in the area of your faith, your faith needs to be perfected. Whatever areas of your faith that are not gotten strong yet, 
or not been established, God wants to perfect them. He wants you to work on those areas and get the word in you on those. 1 Thessalonians 3.10, look what he says. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Is there anything lacking in your faith? It needs to be perfected. It needs to be completed, prepared, fixed, put in order, arranged, you know, the way it should be, adjusted, so you're in line. That's what this word means. Otherwise, let's repair these things. Let's get things in order so your faith is operating. Your faith's got to get strong. Your faith is, is what you're going to live by, what you walk by, how you get victory, how you conquer the enemy, how you receive promises. Everything is going to come through your faith. So it's absolutely essentially essential that you get your faith perfected and fixed and repaired. Anything that is lacking in it. Another thing he wants you to know, verse 12, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. You and I are commanded to walk in love. There's no excuse ever to operate outside of the law of love. You're to increase and abound in love toward not only one another, but also towards all, as it says. And what's going to be the end result of that? To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable. Remember, he wants to bring us the place of being unblameable. In holiness, you'll be unblameable when you're walking in holiness. Before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Another thing, a few more things before we stop. Chapter 4, he says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you received of us how you ought, or how you must, the word die, how you must walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. You see, God wants you to know that you are going to be increasing and abounding continually in your life in the things of God. You're just not going to get, you know, there's no plateauing. There's no just leveling out and coasting, you know. No. You're going to be increasing and abounding. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Works, more works, you know. You're doing all these things. You're gonna, everything that you do, you're going to be abounding more and more. Furthermore, you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Of course, how do you, what are you going to walk by to please him? By the commandments of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The same time, you've got to make sure you're not giving place to any sin areas. Verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. If you're going to be holy, consecrated, pure before the Lord, you must abstain from fornication. Fornication has to be eliminated from your life. You're not going to engage in fornication ever again. You're going to make sure that you're going to, because you sin against your body, you're going to you're, you get yourself one with a harlot, you're allowing evil spirits to come into you. You're going to see all type of curses coming upon you. And uh, if you'd continue in that, you, you could end up in the lake of fire because the whoremongers end up in the lake of fire. That every one of you should know, you're supposed to know, how to possess this vessel in sanctification and honor. You honor God because remember, you're to glorify Him in your body as well as your spirit. You glorify God when you possess the vessel in sanctification and honor. You know to do that. You must not give place to this and allow the enemy to come and to work against you. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles that know not God. Now, we know better. We can't be doing that. That no man go beyond, step over, this means, and defraud, this means get an advantage over his brother in any manner. That means you are never to step over and take advantage of a brother in any manner. It's being manipulative, controlling, dominating, getting advantage over them, doing some, pulling some kind of deal on them to get your, what you want. That's Jezebels that do those kind of things. Because the Lord's the avenger of all, as we have also forewarned you and testified. Don't ever step over, this means. And... Gain, to, to gain an advantage of somebody. And I'm going to take advantage of that person. See how I can do that. No. You've got to make sure you don't ever do that. You are going to see a judgment that will come upon you in your life. Verse 7. 
This will be the last verse. God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He's going to have a holy people. He's going to have a holy people. Remember, he said he's going to present us, that we're going to be holy, we're going to be without blemish, we're going to be unreprovable in his sight when we're presented to the Lord. God's not called you to uncleanness, but he's called you to holiness. God is at work in your life. These are all things that are important to know. Because remember, without holiness, no man sees the Lord. So we must be holy, walk in the ways of the Lord, be above reproach. We've seen many things that are important about your character, the way you function, the way you deal with things, how you take hold of the word, you apply it in your life, you put it in operation in your life, so many things that are important. You get involved in reaching out to other people, you're a servant for the Lord, you're getting involved in the warfare, you're praying without ceasing, all these things. You're being, living your life unto the Lord. And you're conquering. You put off the old man, put on the new man, and walk in the ways of the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the things that I must know according to the Word that I must put in operation to see your work be accomplished in my life. So I will be a holy one. I will be seen to be a faithful one. I will be one walking in your covenant, doing what the Word says, established in the truth, having the foundation laid, being steadfast, so that I never get moved, so that I will be presented as holy and without blemish and unrebukable before the Lord. I thank you. You've called me to be holy. I will walk in your ways. I will see the fruit come forth of the knowledge of God in my life because I will be a hearer and a doer of it. Thank you for performing your promises and bringing this forth in my life that I will be holy before you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're going to continue on this as we go through the New Testament, and we'll be picking up in 1 Thessalonians and talking about a lot of things, including the subject of the rapture the next time when we get together on Sunday morning. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you that we're going to be doers of this word. We will take heed to all the things that are important for us to know, incorporate them in our lifestyle, so we walk in your ways and see your great, mighty work accomplished in our life. Thank you for much fruit from it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.